Welcome to Rampantine Baptist Church, where we'd like to invite you to join Grow Track. This four week course will teach you how to follow Jesus as your Savior, connect to others, discover your God given talents, and find out where you're meant to serve in God's kingdom. In week one, you'll learn to follow taking your first steps, walking with Jesus Christ, and accepting Him as your Lord and Savior. In week two, it's all about being connected. So in this week, you'll find out more about our church and how you can get connected to the family. Week three focuses on discovering. Discover your spiritual gifts and how they can help you build the kingdom of God. The last week will be about serving and finding your place in God's kingdom. Register now by scanning the QR code on screen, sending your name via WhatsApp on 084-223-5892 or log on to rbackchurch.org for more info. We can't wait to see you at GrowTrack. I'm really excited to be bringing the message this morning because it's the start of a new sermon series that you can ask the preaching team. I've been driving them insane about. Right. Guys, they say this isn't loud enough. I have known it's too loud, they say not. Okay, they'll adjust as I speak. So I've been driving the word preaching team insane about this series because it's something that I really feel is something that God's people need to be aware of. That's too loud now, please. <laughs> and that is the war on Christianity. So throughout the month, we're going to be examining different things that are waging war against our faith and how that's playing out, not just in South Africa and in our own communities, but also across the world. And more than that, we're also going to explore how we as the children of God should be reacting to these things and how we should behave with these things happening. Now this morning, for over a month, I've been telling the preaching team, I'm going to be speaking about one specific topic. I was going to be speaking to you about the rise of Islam in countries across the world. All right? I was going to be talking about the millions of Christians that are being persecuted because they don't subscribe to Islamic faith. I even had the outline of which countries are under siege and it could in the next few decades be under Sharia law, purely because the Islamic community is greater than the native community of that country. However, as I was preparing the sermon, as God does sometimes, he just went, no, that's not what you're going to preach on. And he laid something else in my heart. So we will still be listening to that sermon. It will just be late in the month. So today instead, we're going to be listening to something that I really feel is the greatest threat to Christianity today, even more so sometimes than Islam. And that is our own war on Christianity. And that own war comes through a very simple thing. And that is complacency. Complacency in Christianity. By dictionary definition, complacency means an instance of usually unaware or uninformed self-satisfaction. Another definition outlines it as self-satisfaction accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. And that's exactly what complacency is. It's ignorance. And as I did the research into this, the very thing I feared was true. Because you see it throughout the world. That as Christians and as churches, the world is becoming complacent. We are becoming complacent. So this morning, that's what we're going to be looking at. And we'll be starting, as always, by looking at the Word of God. Because believe it or not, the Bible talks about complacency. It mentions it explicitly. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, you can turn to Proverbs 1, verse 28 to 33. If you don't have your Bible or your phone, which I hope is on silent, just throwing it out there, um, it is going to be on the screen at the back. It says, They will call to me and I will not answer. They will look for me, but I'll, they will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them. And here it says, 
and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. So the Bible outlines exactly the definition of complacency as we have it. It talks about people who hate knowledge and prefer to live in a state of ignorance. They prefer it. You know the saying, ignorance is bliss? They like that bliss. Because of this, they've made a choice. Rejecting the advice of the Lord offered through His Word and through the Holy Spirit and spurning His rebuke. Because of this, they get what's coming to them. The Lord says they are destroyed. And beyond just warning us about this complacency, the Bible even goes and gives us examples of this complacency. And one of my favorite ones is found in Luke 17, verse 26 to 28, where it says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them. Now I can imagine how it must have been in Noah's day, the people around him. They must have thought that one of those planks he was building the ark with had fallen on his head. Because let's be honest, we would have also thought that. If he was walking around going, no guys, it's going to rain, and then it's going to rain, and it's going to rain more, and we're going to all die, people would have thought, okay, Kundakis, where are you? And they would have had him booked in. And yet all of a sudden the rain came. And it continued to come. And it didn't stop coming. And because of people's complacency and unwillingness to listen to God, we know what the outcome was. The entire world was destroyed. The same verse in Luke goes on to say, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven. And look at the repetition here. Destroyed them all. Again, we see people living in self-satisfaction. They're happy with their lives. They're happy at the point that they're at. Without knowledge or acceptance that they're living in contrast to how God has called them to live. And what happened? As in the time of Noah, it started to rain. Except this time it wasn't water droplets. It was fire and sulfur. And again, they were all destroyed. And if we look at the church today as a global body, and we look at the church in the context of the things that are attacking it, one of the most prominent things that we can see is that Christians have become complacent. We've become complacent. There are many people, and even pastors, who are unaware of the danger that they are in because they are uninformed and they are complacent. And they are content in living their life the way they are. You know, I mentioned we had the leadership planning and evaluation, and during that we did a, a teaching from a sermon given at ARC. And one of the best things that stood out about it was the, guy, the pastor said, we as Christians are not called to live on the mountain. If we're living on the mountain in our comfort zone, there's a problem. We are called to live in the valley where the dry bones are and where the monsters are, because that's where we operate. That's where we share the gospel. That's where we can minister God's word. But there's too many pastors that are living on the mountain and too many Christians that have scaled the mountain and are up there and they're happy there. They don't want to go back down to the valley. They forget that they were found in that valley, but they don't want to go find others in that valley. And the shocking thing is, there's clear signs of complacency in Christianity and not taking the word of God and his warnings and his instruction clear. Now, some of these signs you may have already seen, you may already know them. Other ones you may have heard of, but you haven't really identified them as what they are. But this morning we're going to quickly delve into five of these signs and effects. And the first one is when our Christian life becomes a tradition. It is no longer a relationship, it's a tradition. And this, unfortunately, is true for many people. And I'm not saying here in RBC, I'm saying globally, this is true for many people. When we come to church just to say that we did and that we were at church, we can tick our attendance box. Not because we're expecting to meet with the Lord and experience His Spirit. We're only going because we can say we were there. When we shorten or stop our quiet times with the Lord, because, let's be honest, who has the time? I mean, the Lord understands, you know? The Lord understands my schedule, He'll get it. And so we stop our quiet times, or we cut them down to five minutes, even though late in the day we're going to spend five hours catching up on TV. What about when we pray in meetings? 
only because we're called on and Gareth stood on stage and said, Christy, pray. Not because we cannot wait to cry out to God. Not because we're excited to speak to God. Well, what about for the youth? I know this is a big one. We're more excited about the music behind the song than the message of the song, which is giving glory to God. All these things are small points to the fact that we're no longer living a Christian life that is actively seeking God in every single area. We're just going through the motions of being a Christian. It's the tradition of being a Christian. We're used to the fact that every Sunday we wake up a little bit early and we get ready and we go to church. It's just part and parcel. What it actually is, is complacency. And it's complacency in the face of what we're actually called to do. In John 15 verse 8 to 10 it says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As my Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His life. As Christians, it shouldn't be a tradition. We should be bearing fruit. Not as a traditional Christian, but as a disciple of Christ. We're about to abide in God's laws, keep His commandments, and live a life that chases Him more and more in every single aspect. If we're doing that, we're going to find it very hard to become complacent. The second sign of complacency is tolerance to sin or desensitivity to sin. Now, I'm the media guy in our church, all right? I will be the first person to tell you, go and like our socials, go and follow us on Instagram, go and check out our website, right? But even I will admit, nothing is more dangerous to the, um, to the standards of God than media. Because media can and does desensitize and change society. By constantly showing things that are considered as taboo, it makes it the norm. It's no longer taboo. It's just, we see it every day. It's on every TV show. Now, I don't like using this as an example because this is an entire sermon series on its own, which we have covered, rbapchurch.org. You can go watch it there. All right. Yes, branding. I told you I'm the media guy. But I'm going to use the example of the LGBT. I think they're now LGBTI2+, LGBTQI2+, they've gone alphanumeric, I don't understand why, but anyway, they've gone alphanumeric. But society has become completely desensitized to a subject that when I was growing up was taboo. You did not mention it. Now, try and find a TV show that doesn't have a homosexual in it. Good luck. I'll wait. Okay, good luck, you're not going to find one. And this desensitivity to something that used to be regarded as sin has led to a tolerance. A study conducted a decade ago in the US, it was conducted in 2014, revealed that 48% of churches between 2006 and 2012 in the US started allowing homosexual um, couples to apply for full membership of the church. They were a fully-fledged partner of the church, even though they were living in sin. Worse still, 26% of those churches allowed those same couples into leadership positions in their church. Even though the Bible clearly says in Leviticus, you shall not lie with a man as a woman, it's an abomination. It's against God. And if you think I'm picking on America, it's here too. In Africa... The Anglican, the Methodist, the Dutch Reformed, the Uniting Reformed, the Uniting Presbyterian, and Deo Gloria Church have all accepted homosexuals into their congregations. They've been very clever about it because they have footnotes that go, you can only be a member if you're celibate in the relationship. What a load of nonsense. All they are trying to do is change what is right to suit people. And in doing that, they're becoming tolerant to it. They're becoming tolerant to sin. And that's where we are as a Christian society. We are so scared of offending somebody with the truth of God's word and the fact that God says it's wrong, that instead we just go, oh, we'll make a footnote there, an addendum in the contract, and then everything will be fine. No one needs to be offended, and we've got ourselves covered. 
I'd love to hear the argument when the people that write those things get to heaven and God asks them about it. Honestly, if I could be on a, a fly on the wall at any point in my life, that would be it. Because I'd love to hear the justification. I can just say them standing, uh, 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 they said. And God's just going to go, no. The next thing I already touched on briefly is that we have to bear fruit if we are not complacent. This is one of the most visible and sadly common signs of complacency in Christianity. So for this, I'm going to pick on Europe. I've done America, I've done Africa, let's go to Europe. The Church of England is estimated to close more than 20 churches per year. Not open or plant new churches, close 20 churches per year. In Denmark, more than 200 churches have been made redundant due to no attendance. In Germany in the last decade, more than 515 churches have shut their doors. And it gets worse when you don't look at the buildings, when you look at the people who identify as disciples of Christ. In Spain, a country that has traditionally been Christian, over two-thirds of the population say that they are either agnostic or atheist. They no longer believe in God. Um, Italy lost more than six million Christians in churches between 2020 and now, in four years. Six million churches have dro oh, Christians have dropped out of church. In France, People who say that they have no religion has increased from 16 to 40 percent. So Christianity is under attack and it's because of complacency. And all these people saying that they no longer follow Christ, that they're no longer Christian, that's what's led to churches closing their doors. And do you want to know what the worst part is? Europe has some of the most beautiful churches. I mean, we can all agree we are blessed with our facilities, right? But Europe... Guys, those architects are on another level, okay? They have the stained glass, they have the molding and that. Those churches are being sold and repurposed as Airbnbs. You can go book a night. Worse, they're being sold and repurposed as nightclubs. The very thing that goes against God, that encourages drinking and hooking up with people and partying, that's what's happening in the churches in Europe. Because Christians aren't opening their mouths and they're not bearing fruit. Because all of this is indicative that Christians in the church are not bearing fruit and reaching those around them with the saving message of the gospel. Matthew 7 verse 19 to 20 is very clear. It says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore by your fruits you will know them. And they are not known by their fruits. They are being chopped down and thrown into the fire. That's why their churches are being sold. Because they're complacent. And if we're complacent in our work with God and in the calling that He has in our lives, we're not fulfilling the task that God gave to every single one of us in Matthew 20. We all know it. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, because surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. But if we're complacent, we're not going to be doing that. The fourth sign of complacency is that we experience no spiritual growth. We may start off on fire, eager to learn everything about God after we receive salvation. Guys, if there's a church meeting, we're there. Okay, You are not going to find us not at a church meeting. That's how we start off. There is no way you are going to miss us when we can find out something new about God. But slowly but surely we may slow down. Slowly but surely we may hit a wall. Slowly but surely life catches up and then suddenly we're not growing anymore we think we are but actually we're deceiving ourselves spiritual growth as we all know can only be experienced through walking daily with god and keeping his commands i mean we can't say we don't know how to do that how do we walk daily with god we read his word we listen to his spirit we spend time in fellowship with him through prayer and intercession we come together as believers to worship Him and to learn more things about Him. And if we're not doing any of this, we're not experiencing growth. We're like babies. We're staying on milk. I mean, I look at Zach. If he was still on baby formula only and not on solid food, I would have so much more money, guys. <laughs> My food bowl would be half. But he wouldn't be growing at the rate he's growing. I mean, we're buying new clothes for that child every three days because he's just stretching. But it's because of the substance that he's getting. He's not just on milk. 
And that's true for our spiritual lives as well. Hebrews 5, 13 to 14 says, Anyone who loves milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching of righteousness. But solid food or meat, proper red meat, is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And this is an encouragement to every single one of us. Continue growing. Get off the milk. Who still wants milk when you can have a T-bone steak? I mean, come on. Vegetarians, I apologize, you can have a broccoli, all right? But we should continue to grow. I mean, even our church's vision as RBC, who knows our vision is? Love, grow, go. Grow is such an important factor, it's right there in our vision. If you walk out the door, it's the first thing you're going to see. Grow. Grow in spiritual maturity and grow into service in God's kingdom. Because that's the only way we can truly move from milk onto the meat of God's word and stop being complacent. And then finally, one of the biggest factors that stops this growth and causes complacency is indulgence. Now, we live in a world where everything of the world invites us to indulge. Right? Indulge in the pleasures that the world offers. From the things we see on TV to the things we see on social media, to the advertising that companies spend billions of dollars targeting you specifically based on your internet patterns, indulgence is the world's number one tool to get us away from God. And it works. Whether it be indulging in alcohol or drugs or sexual promiscuity or any of the other things the world has to offer, the focus is on what makes us as a human being feel good. You know, don't worry about anything else. What makes you feel good? Not on what God wants or plans. In general, the thing that we need to indulge in, that the world wants us to indulge in, is actually exactly contrary to what God wants or plans for our life. They're not on the same path. And one of the verses that I personally love that hints at resisting this indulgence, and it's a verse I'm pretty sure you're going to hear a lot throughout the sermon series, is Romans 12 verse 2. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you're able to test and improve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because we're not supposed to conform to the indulgence of the world. We're called separately to that. Leave the pattern of the world. We should stand out. We should be different. And that requires a boldness. All these areas of complacency require a boldness that today seems to be lacking in Christianity and in churches. And because of this, this complacency, we're waging a war against ourselves, against our own faith. We're fighting against the very thing that God has called us to do. And yet resisting it and stopping the complacency is so simple. It's so simple to stop being complacent. There's three things I'm going to mention quickly. And the first is, understand that God has called us to live with Him and by Him. He wants, He's always wanted a personal relationship with us. And not one of your personal relationships here on earth do not put effort into and do not grow the relationship. So why is it different with God? He wants to be by our side every single day, regardless of what we're doing. Whether we're at work, work isn't boring for God. He still wants to be there with us. When we're sitting through a lecture from our wife because we didn't load the dishwasher again, God still wants to be there, you know, hopefully keeping her quiet. Sometimes in the busyness of life, we can forget this and forget that what we are called to, to have a relationship with God and to live as foreigners here on earth. To be different. 1 Peter 2 verse 11 to 12 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires. Listen to what it says here. That wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of doing wrong because you're doing something different to them, live such good lives that though they accuse you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on this day. So to avoid being complacent, we should be so living so closely entwined with God and this is the part I love, that when Jesus arrives, people worship Him because of our actions. I mean, how encouraging is it that you can reach people just through your actions? You don't even have to go and speak to them. Just let them see the difference in you and see the difference that you are compared to the world. Secondly, we need to be bold. 
We need to be bold in Christianity. Too often, the, the churches in South Africa with the LGBTQ uh, agenda are proof of this. Too often, the church shies away for standing up for what is right in the sight of God, not in the sight of the world. We forget that we have the authority to stand up against the world and against indulgence and against tolerance. Tolerating sins that we shouldn't be. We have authority. Luke 10 verse 19 says us, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Everything that the world is doing is the enemy. The tolerance of sin and the desensitivity of society is the enemy's plan to get people away from God's word. Because it goes directly against him. We have authority. We don't have to stand for it as a church, as Christians. But we need boldness. We need to be bold in it. And that includes against our boss when he tries to make us work on the Sunday because that's God's day. It includes against our family when they say, oh, you're always at church. Why are you doing that with your life? It includes our friends. Do you know what was so amazing earlier this week? Christy was sitting in the lounge and she was going, what is that Bible verse? What's the reference? As if I remember, I'm terrible with references. And I was like, why are you asking? And there was a youth that was messaging her. And he was asking her for ammunition, you know, the way they do, because he was having a debate with his friends. Because they prescribed to, or subscribed to this whole love is love. Uh, again, it comes back to this agenda, which is in every area of our lives lately. It irritates me to no end. But again, he was having an argument with his friends about homosexuality. And he didn't care that they were his friends. He didn't care what they thought of them. He didn't care about anything. He went, God's word says, no, you're wrong. And he wanted the ammunition to tell them you're wrong. And he was bold about it. And if more Christians start being bold like that, I can tell you now the world would be a completely different place. Because if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. There's no gray area here. And lastly, we can avoid complacency by being encouraged that God is faithful. And he is always with us. I mean, Matthew 28 verse 20 ends by saying, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Psalms tell us how faithful God is through all generations to the end of time. And this is a promise that God makes. A promise to be with us, whether we're on the mountain or in that valley. In that valley, we'll probably find him even closer to us. But he's with us always. In the face of anything we encounter, even if it means standing up and the world laughing at us, God is still with us. This alone should encourage us to avoid complacency and stand up for God. Stand up for what is right. Because when we're standing up, we're not alone. God is standing there with us. So this month we're going to continue looking at the various aspects that are attacking our faith. But if anything you learn from today is be encouraged. Be encouraged that God is there. And if not managed properly, we can become our own worst enemy. But God is there to help us, to stop us. Okay, we can easily become that person who's pointing at the mirror going, it's you. Meanwhile, the mirror's pointing at us going, it's you. But no, it's okay, it's one of us. That's affecting our own walk. But God is with us. He calls us. He encourages us. And he helps us mitigate complacency. And it's throughout scripture. Go and read your Bible. It's throughout scripture. God inspires his people. And he gives them boldness to stand out. To not grow complacent. So why wouldn't he do it for us? Because he's doing it. Every single day he's doing us. He gives us a new boldness. If we have a fire within for Him and His Word, He's there. If we hunger for God, He will feed us. If we thirst for Him, He will refresh us. And if we yearn to never grow complacent, but constantly have that fire in us that's moving us on towards what God is calling us, the Holy Spirit is there to walk with us. He's got our hand. He's got our back. He's got our toe. He's got everything. We just need to stand in boldness. Because God will bless that boldness and each and every one of us will be able to do incredible things for his kingdom. As long as we're not complacent. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our head. Father, we just thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the examples you give, Lord. And we know 
that as a church, as a Christian um, society, Lord, worldwide, we need to repent, Father. We need to repent from complacency, from stepping back and going, we don't need to do it some other Christian will, from saying we don't need to be bold, we can tolerate that, we can make an exception for that, just because we don't want to offend somebody. Meanwhile, Lord, that's not what you have called us to do. You have not called us to not offend somebody. You have called us to share your gospel. And if that offends somebody, they need to ask themselves why they're offended. So, Lord, we pray that you will give us a boldness, Lord, that you will give us your spirit that can move us out of complacency, Lord, to where we are on fire again to share your word with everyone we meet. Lord, to show the world what it means to be a Christian, Lord, that even the people we don't speak to will see our lives and say there is something different about that person and that you may be glorified through that. Father, we thank you that you keep us, that you encourage us, that you inspire us, and that you call us to live like this in your kingdom. And we pray that as we go into the rest of the year, Father, into the rest of our lives, Father, that will be constantly in our mind that we are not alone, that you are with us, that as the world degrades, as things get worse, as wars continue, as Christianity has continued to be frowned upon, Lord, you are with us in every step. And we thank you for this, Lord. Amen. Amen.